Hi, everyone. I'm Rachel Harkness. I'm the Programming Manager at Portland Public Library. Thank you for joining us today. We're also joined by Sarah Skowinski, the head of our adult services at Portland Public Library and our new fiction librarian, uh, Rebecca Starr. Uh, this event is part of the Portland Public Library Literary Lunch Series, and we're thrilled to be hosting Stephanie Solo and Elizabeth Wetmore here today to discuss their debut novels, Last One Out, Shut Off the Lights, and Valentine. So Stephanie Sulo's work has appeared in Glimmer, Train, Oxford American, Ecotone, Tin House, News Stories from the South, and other journals and anthologies. And she has been supported by fellowships from the Wallace Stegner Foundation Fellowship Program at Stanford University and the Camargo Foundation, the Vermont Studio Center and the National Endowment for the Arts and the Fine Arts Work Center in Provincetown. She received an MFA from the Iowa Writers Workshop and has taught creative writing at the Art Institute of Chicago, Stanford University, and the University of Southern Maine. She's originally from Lake Charles, Louisiana, but now lives in Maine and is in, in joining us today from Brunswick. Elizabeth Wetmore is a graduate of the Iowa Writers Workshop. Her fiction has appeared in Epic, Canyon Review, Colorado Review, Baltimore Review, Crab Orchard Review, Iowa Review and other literary journals. She is the recipient of a fellowship from the National Endowment from the Arts and two fellowships from the Illinois Arts Council, as well as a grant from the Barbara Deming Foundation. She was also a Rona Jaffe Scholar in Fiction at Breadloaf and a Fellow at the McDowell Colony and one of six writers in res residence at Hedgebrook. A native of West Texas, she lives and works in Chicago and that's where she's joining us from, from today. So thank you, Steph and Elizabeth, for joining us, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Rachel. We're so glad to be here. Beth and I are old friends. Steph and I were talking before this all started about how this is a literary lunch, and on some level, we feel like we should just do what we usually do with, at lunch, which is just spend like, you know, as much time as possible shooting the breeze. So <laughs> talking about our children. <laughs> So, um, should I start, Steph? Yeah, Is that what we decided? It. Okay, so we're, I'm going to read a little bit from the book. Um, and again, thank you for having me. It's really good to see all your faces here. Um, wish we could be together in person, but so glad to be able to do it this way too. So, um, so I, I don't think this really needs any setup or anything. That's part of the reason I chose it. Um, <clears throat> Every August for nearly 30 years, she taught English in an overheated classroom filled with farm boys and cheerleaders and roughneck wannabes reeking of aftershave. Corrine would spot the name of at least one misfit or dreamer on her fall roster. In a good year, there might be two or three of them, the outcast and weirdos, the cellist and geniuses and acne ridden, ridden tuba players, the poets, the boys whose asthma precluded a high school football career and the girls who hadn't learned to hide their smarts. Stories save lives, Corrine said to those students. To the rest of them, she said, I'll wake you when it's over. While a box fan together with the small cell-like window that she cracked open every morning labored heroically to clear the sweat and bubble gum and malice out of the classroom air, Corrine let her gaze wander gauging the reactions of her various misfits. Invariably, some little shit would pop his gum or belch or fart, but one or two of those kids would remember her words forever. They would graduate and get the hell out of Dodge, sending her letters from UT or Tech or the Army and once from India. And for most of Corrine's teaching career, that had been enough. When I say stories, she told those tormented souls, I also mean poems and hymns, bird song and wind in the trees. I mean the hue and cry, the call and response and the silence in between. I mean memory. So hang on to that next time someone's beating the shit out of you after school. Stories can save your life. This Corrine still believes, even if she hasn't been able to focus on a book since Potter died. And memory wanders, sometimes a cap full of wind on a treeless plain, sometimes a twister in late spring. Nights, she sits on the front porch and lets those stories keep her alive for a little while longer. 
Let me skip ahead here. Corrine is 10 years old and sitting in the front row at her grandmother's funeral. When her father starts crying so hard, he has to hand off the eulogy to the minister. She finally understands the enormity of their loss. She is 12 and her daddy comes home from a rig with a bottle of moonshine and two fingers missing. Don't cry, baby girl, he tells her. I didn't even need those fingers. He, he tells her, now if it were these, he holds <laughs> up his other hand and waggles his fingers and they both fall out laughing but she is remembering what her grandmother said the first time they saw an oil well come in. Lord, help us all. She is 28 years old and a foreman calls to tell her there's been an explosion at the Stanton well. She drives to the hospital with Alice sleeping next to her on the front seat, convinced Potter is already dead, trying to figure out how the hell she is going to move through this life without him. But there he is, sitting up in bed with a shit-eaten grin on his face. Ugly flash burn stain his face and neck. Honey, he says, I fell off the platform right before it blew and the smile dies on his face. Some of the other guys didn't though. It is October, 1929 and Corrine's father is home for lunch. A man who generally hates idle conversation, nattering, he calls it. Today, he can hardly stop talking for long enough to chew his sandwich. The pen's well has come in a surface blowout so powerful that pieces of drill pipe, caliche, and rock were blown 50 feet into the air. The well blew at nine o'clock that morning and it is still spewing crude oil. Who knows how many barrels are flowing across the desert? The drill operator has no idea when he'll be able to cap it. This here's a historic day, Prestige tells Corrine and her grandmother, Viola Tillman. This is going to put Odessa on the map. Corrine and Viola are already gathering up their hats and gloves when Prestige shakes his head and stuffs the last of his fried egg sandwich into his mouth. An oil well ain't no place for little girls, or, he looks at Viola, old ladies. Y'all stay home, I mean it. Corrine is tall for her age, but she still has to sit all the way at the edge of the driver's seat to reach the starter pedal on her father's Model T. They careen across the Lano Estacado, the little girl and old woman bouncing madly on the car seat while some of Prestige's Herefords look on, their jaws working, working. The pen's well is still a mile away when the sky turns black and the ground beneath the car starts to tremble. The air fills with so much debris they have to cover their mouths with handkerchiefs. Lord help us all, Viola says. As it falls back to earth, the oil spills out across the land and covers everything in its path. The purple sage and the blue grandma grasses that Viola loves, the blue stems and buffalo grasses that come nearly to Corrine's waist. A prairie dog family stands some 30 yards from the growing hole in the ground, their faces lifted as they bark at one another. A small female scutters to the edge of a burrow and peers inside, and Corrine imagines every hidey hole and den within five miles filled with confused little creatures who will never know what hit them. But the 50 or so men and boys who stand around the site aren't looking at the grass or the critters or the earth. They are looking at the sky, their faces wrapped. It is going to kill every living thing, Viola says. Corrine frowns and sniffs the air while her grandmother sags against the passenger door. Viola's face is pale, her eyes cloudy. She coughs and holds her hand over her mouth and nose. That smell, she says, it's like every cow in West Texas farted at the same time. And our trees, she cries, spotting now a stand of young pecan trees in the direct path of a river of oil. What about them? But it's going to put West Texas on the map, Corrine says, and Daddy says this land's not worth a tinker's dam anyway. Viola Tillman stares at her granddaughter as if she has never seen her before in her life. The Lano Estacado might not be good for anything except stars and space and quiet, the winter songbirds and the sharp smell of post cedars after even a little rain, but she loves it. Together, the old woman and little girl have steered their horses through dry arroyos and creosote forest, then sat quietly and watched a family of javelina forage through a patch of prickly pear. Together, they found and named the largest tree on their property, Galloping Ghost, for the shaggy bark that resembles Red Grange's raccoon coat. Now Viola's face is the color of cold embers and her hands are trembling. Take me home, 
She tells her granddaughter, yes, ma'am, Corrine says, can you drive me back to Georgia? In three months, Viola will be dead. And by then her granddaughter will have seen enough of an oil boom to loathe every one of them for the rest of her life. For three days, the pen's well spews an uncontrolled stream of crude oil into the air. A house-sized pool forms in a matter of hours and then quickly breaches the sides, destroying everything in its path. More than 30,000 barrels of oil spill out across the earth before the men get control of the well. And when they finally do, the men stand on the slick platform, their hands and faces stained black. They shout and shake hands and slap each other on the back. We capped her, they tell each other. We got her. I love that so much. Um, and Corrine is one of my favorite characters in the book. I think she is for many people. Um, Beth and I are, come from neighboring states. She's from Texas. Um, and I grew up in Southwest Louisiana. And uh, the landscapes couldn't be more different, but the influence of oil and gas on the place um, is so um, we sort of echo each other in that way, I think. And my story collection is set in Lake Charles, Louisiana and Sulphur, Louisiana. Yes, that's an actual town um, <laughs> named after the smell of sulfur produced by the uh, petrochemical plants that line the, the shore of the lake um, and do indeed smell like uh, every cow in the state farted. Um, it's really <laughs> quite a stink. Um, so I'm going to read a little bit from a story called uh, The Ranger Queen of Sulphur, which is about one of the um, misfits who I think probably would have had a, a different time in Sulphur, Louisiana, if she'd landed in someone like Corrine's class. Um, she, her name is Deanna. She lives with her parents. She's 25. She has just spent the whole night getting high and playing video games and she's supposed to meet her brother at the doctor's office for a, a or at the at an obesity specialist um, office to find out what to do for him because he's heavily overweight. So this is the morning of the appointment. She had written the information about Jonathan's appointment around the edges of a pay stub and stashed it somewhere not obvious, not on her desk, not in her wallet. Finally, she found it on her dresser under bras and Coke cans. When she pulled it from the mess, she started an avalanche. She kicked aside the towel that was blocking the crack under her door and gave her shoes a twice over on the way out, once to see if they were tied, they were, and once more because by the time she looked up, she'd already forgotten whether they were or not, and she was almost on her way. Her mother was in the kitchen stirring a pot of roux on the stove, easing the bubbling flour and oil brew from pasty beige to nearly black. It filled the house with a charred, ashy tang that smelled both catastrophic and delicious. I've got the ladies for lunch, she said. The ladies being a set of poof-haired old dames from the local Knights of Columbus Hall who invaded each other's homes once a week to confer over crime maps and recipes, to worry each other into a state of panic over cholesterol, and to ask humbling questions of whatever adult children still occupied rooms that should by now have been converted into arts and crafts or computer retreats for their retired parents. Deanna's mother waved a dish towel like a fan to drive off a hot flash. Her eyes behind the fogged up lenses of her glasses were distressed. What do you smell like? I don't know, a billy goat, a puppy dog? I really wish you wouldn't burn incense. It's hard on your daddy's lungs. Are you going to the doctor with Jonathan? Well, I told him I would. Don't let him agree to anything expensive. He still doesn't have insurance. Here, I want you to bring him some of this. Into a plastic pitcher, Deanna's mother poured a murky brown liquid from the jar that had been sitting atop the fridge for weeks with a gray fungus thick as a pancake floating on its surface. She had doted on this concoction, guarded it nervously, so difficult had it been to get her hands on the mushroom the mother fungus, she called it, originally obtained from who knows what witch doctor and reputed to work as, among other things, a decongestant, antibiotic, digestive aid, energy booster, stress buster, weight loss supplement, hair thickener, rust remover, and foot soak. I'm telling you, Deanna said, he's not gonna drink that. 
You tell him I said he better. He needs to do something or he's going to end up like Papa Curtis. She covered the mouth of the pitcher with a layer of plastic wrap. Then she poured more tea into a mug and said, go give that to your father. Deanna's father, a six foot five Goliath, tethered to his recliner by oxygen tubes that snaked from his nose to a humming generator on the floor, sat watching television in the living room. Above his chair, a trio of trophies, deer heads with nappy fur and ponderous antlers, hung alongside the bow that had killed them back in the days when he could breathe. Since then, he had fallen under evil enchantment, toxic rags brought home in the pockets of toxic work clothes, invisibly powdered with dust from the plant, which Deanna, as a little girl, had thought was an actual plant, leafy and noxious, that her father spent his days pruning and watering. Those work rags, her mother would say, telling the story for the 500th time, I shook them out in the yard where the kids were playing. Nobody told us not to. I threw them in the wash with everything else. Mom wants you to drink this, Deanna says. Her father reached up through the network of tubes and took the mug. He rasped between short, sudden breaths. Is this that foul potion she's been brewing in the jar? That woman is trying to poison me. He sniffed it, took a sip, and made a little noise of surprise and delight. Is it good, she said. Not bad. As Deanna turned to leave, he grabbed her forearm and looked at her with pleading eyes, his mouth a pucker beneath the cannula mustache. Boo, catch me that remote control. If I have to watch another Andy Griffith, I'm gonna shut this machine off and die. On her way to the hospital, still high, Deanna imagined liposuction too vividly and knew she was going to have to ditch her brother's appointment. Just last week, she'd seen the procedure documented on TV in troubling detail. The tube laced through a hole in the flesh, the slurping, slapping, wet sound as it jabbed and sucked at the curdy fat and siphoned it yellow and blood marbled into a jar. She could not possibly sit next to Jonathan while the doctor described such things. And besides, she was nearly late. She stopped at a green light. The car behind her honked. She took a left and drove east on the long stretch of road that was Sulphur's main drag. She passed car dealerships, trailer dealerships, dollar stores, and the cross street that led to the hospital. She passed the payday loan where she spent most afternoons. After two miles through tank farms and a sloppy complex of hotels and floating casinos, she crossed the bridge to Lake Charles and pulled off finally at the beach. She backed her truck across the sand lowered the tailgate and stretched belly down on the rusted bed. Greenish foam washed up at the shoreline and congealed. On the opposite shore, a petrochemical metropolis, the likely source of this muck, Vista, Olin, City Services, a long white burn-off cloud trailed from a smokestack to join a low blanket of actual clouds, which made it seem the plants and refineries might be the source of all weather and gloom. If Deanna had some magic thing of power, a ring of PVC pipe forged in the fires of Vista Chemical, say, she might breach that dark city, sneak past the guards and alarms, and chuck the ring into a vat of boiling liquid plastic. The whole place would be consumed in its own evil flames. All would bow to the heroine who had broken the poisonous magic, Deanna Lafleur, the ranger queen of sulfur. But she was only who she was, a girl who had twice been held back in middle school, having sopped up the bleak conviction that all roads lead to Kmart or the plant, so why bother? A girl upon whom, at 25, it was only now starting to dawn that certain basic occupational skills might at least rescue her from the lowest forms of drudgery, but who, true to her nature, skipped three of every four classes. In fact, she had a typing class later that morning. Would she go? Probably not. Beyond the tailgate, the foul breast water kissed the shore. Down the beach, a pair of young men had turned up with a four-wheeler and were skidding out across the sand, shouting. A rebel flag streamed behind them. Assholes, Deanna said. Then she stood up in the bed of her truck and yelled it, assholes, assholes. But clearly they couldn't hear her. Thank you. So Beth, um, I was hoping that you could describe a little bit more the place where you come from 
And what is what is Odessa like? I think uh, most of us are Mainers here. Um, again, we come from a similar sort of economic backgrounds and similar sort of places in the sense of the oil and gas industry's influence, but they're very different. Um, you know, where you come from, there's water fishing. Um, where I come from, there's no water. Um, West Texas is about 80, the Permian Basin, where I'm from, is about 86,000 square miles. Um, it's the vast region out in West Texas that's rich in oil and natural gas. Um, desert meets um, high plains um, and uh, gets about, uh, on average, less than 14 um, inches of rain a year. Um, so, um, and, and I was thinking of the section you were reading. Uh, first of all, you read it so beautifully and I, I love that story. Um, I always think in that section about Chris Christofferson who said he wrote, help me make it through the night when he was working on an offshore oil rig off the coast of Louisiana, looking out across the water and looking at all the lights from the rigs um, and that kind of weird sort of destructive beauty. You know, neither of us have lived in our hometowns for many years. And I, I was thinking about that kind of that old adage that every story is a love story, you know? And I was wondering if you've always loved your hometown well enough to write about it, or if you've struggled to find ways to love it, you know, well enough to tell these stories with the kind of depth and decency and beauty that I see in every single one of your stories. Um, and, and what's helped you? What's helped you tell those stories? Oh, I think like you, Beth, I've had a, a very ambivalent relationship with my hometown. Um, I, I, it, I think it took leaving to, to feel the kind of compassion for the place. I don't know. I, I, I had sort of a fractured experience of my hometown, actually. I was raised in um, this lovely little neighborhood of um, Cajuns who had moved from Mamou and Eunice, you know, these little tiny prairie towns north of Lafayette. Uh, they had moved to Lake Charles, which is a, a pretty big, you know, town. Um, uh, they had moved to Lake Charles and after the war to, you know, work in the oil industry and to find more, you know, there was more work there, obviously. Um, and, but they, they carried with them their country ways. And so, you know, I was raised by my single mom and my grandparents and this extended family who all lived under the same roof in this little neighborhood um, that felt sort of sheltered from the economic devastation that was also happening in Lake Charles at the time. Um, it was when I was growing up there, it was the, you know, late 70s and 80s, the oil crash was, um, was depressing the, the local economy, people were leaving, the, the title of my collection, Last One Out Shot Off the Lights, is from a bumper sticker uh, that people would sort of cheekily slap on their cars because the, you know, businesses and young people were, were hauling up and moving out. Um, so there was this, I had this profound sense of home um, in this place at the same time that it was, it was, you know, beyond that profound sense of home, there was a, a, a place that was depressed in more ways than economically, you know, um, and was, there was not really a bookstore to speak of, you know, <laughs> there was, it was, it's, it's, you know, it's, it has problems with, you know, race relations. It's a, it's a hard place to grow up if you have a sensibility, like, like many writers do, but um, I, th I think it took leaving to, to feel the sense of loss around the, the part of it that was um, uplifting to me and that formed the better parts of me. Now, what yeah, about you, Beth? Uh -huh. Well, we were talking earlier about how, you know, culturally our hometowns are really different, you know. Um, you all have fishing, you know, and a kind of, and people who came to, to and settled that area with a real deep sense of culture, whereas Odessa, you know, were it not for the oil patch, right, Odessa would still just be a quiet little stop on the Texas and Pacific Railroad where you loaded up a few cattle. And, and when I say a few cattle, I mean a few, right, because that land is so harsh that you can't even really run many cattle on it. You can't really grow much, a little bit of sorghum, a little bit of cotton. And so in a lot of ways, my hometown exists because of the oil and gas industry. Um, when I was doing my research, I, I realized that Odessa was 
b before oil, the few people who were there were mostly um, disgruntled Southerners who wanted nothing to do with the with the Union after they lost the war. <laughs> So they figured by going to as far out to West Texas as they could, they could pretty much do whatever they wanted, right? And you see that to this day, you know, the the sort of lingering racism that's really endemic to my hometown. Um, and then the other group of people who settled my hometown were apparently a group of um, Midwesterners who got sort of sucked into a land swindle. And by the time they realized they'd been sucked into a land swindle, they were already there and they didn't have any money to go anywhere else. Um, so, so in a lot of ways, you know, our hometowns are very, your hometown has a lot deeper roots in a lot of ways than Odessa does. Um, you know, for me, um, you know, and, and when I left, I, I left, you know, um, I, I, want, I left at 18 and I was done. <laughs> and it took me a really long time to, to be able to write about my hometown at all. Um, for me, it was falling back in love with the land, um, you know, maybe because I lived in, mostly in cities after I left Odessa, you know, over the years as I would go home to visit family and I always borrowed my sister's pickup truck and took long drives through the oil patch. And over the years, you know, I think I really came to appreciate the space and, and uninhabited places, you know, um, and quiet um, and dark skies in a way that I didn't really appreciate as a child. You know, you don't have to go very far out of my hometown before the oil rigs fall away and, and you find yourself in the great Chihuahuan desert, you know, in that beautiful, um, stark land, um, you know, out by the Big Bend region. And actually that land has really been off, off, off limits, um, you know, up until very recently. One of the things that's actually happening out there now is that oil companies are buying up old cattle ranches um, so that they can harvest the water out there and haul it into the Permian Basin for fracking or haul or sell it to companies in southern New Mexico and hauling it up to southern New Mexico for drilling and fracking as well um, because the state of New Mexico um, actually doesn't allow that, right? And one of the things you and I have talked about is that Louisiana has come quite a bit further in recent years and sort of regulating, you know, and, and offsetting some of the environmental devastation of the oil and gas industry in a way that Texas just will not come along. Well, I wanted to ask you what the, if, what the environmental movement looks like there. I know in Louisiana, it's it, speaking ill of the oil and gas industry that, is, that has played a large part in devastating the coastline. And uh, you know, I don't, I don't know if you guys remember 10 years ago this year, the, the BP oil spill of the, when the Deepwater Horizon rig exploded um, and there was that gusher for months. Um, I've been reading a lot of uh, articles from the Baton Rouge Advocate because my, my next book is set during that time span and, um, you know, about that, how that unfolded and the, the, the attitude that seems to be most prevalent is that you know you can't well, you don't blame BP. I don't blame BP. Accidents happen, you know. <laughs> Whoops. Um, and you you can't really speak ill of the the hand that you know you don't bite the hand that feeds you. Um, but at the same time, Louisiana does have this deep connection to the place, and the oil industry has made it possible for um, fishermen whose livelihood wouldn't necessarily be sustainable otherwise to continue living there. They want to stay at all costs. Um, and so you make a deal with the devil, the oil industry, and, and you work in the oil patch half the year and go out and, you know, harvest your oyster beds half the year. But what happens when an oil spill, you know, devastates the oyster beds or when dredging canals through the marshes means that the land is eroding at a rate of, you know, a football field an hour. Um, you, but there's still, you know, there's, there's an a lively environmental movement there because even, you know, even on the right, you know, these good old boys with their guns shooting ducks want the land to be there for the duck, you know, and the ducks to come through and the, uh, they want to keep their livelihood and their their recreational hunting going, and so they're they will take part in environmental efforts to save the coastline or to protect, you know, endangered species. And, yeah. But what does that look like in Texas? Well, I'll tell you, it's a fledgling. 
-hmm. you know, I mean, what a little, there is an environmental movement in Texas that's sprung up in the last, you know, 15 to 20 years, you know, I think there are a lot of people in far west Texas out in the Big Bend area who are horrified right at the thought you know of the oil and gas industry encroaching you know on that land out there um and of course you know right now the the permian pipeline is going right through the hill country <laughs> where people actually have a little bit of money and you know and deep roots you know and deep ties to the land um you know, the problem in texas is that you know mineral rights and water rights and the prohibition against interfering with oil and gas industry is actually written into the constitution so, you know, so some years back when the city of Denton tried to pass a law saying that there, that there would be no fracking allowed within city limits, right? Um, so it was a pretty simple city ordinance. They didn't want fracking across the street from the high school, right? Um, and that was immediately struck down by the Texas Supreme Court um, because it interfered with the ability to to, to, to mine, you know. Um, so it's a fledgling movement, but it's there. And there are a lot of people out there fighting the good fight. You know, I was thinking about what you said about the kind of fatalism, the kind of shoulder shrugging sort of, oh, well, you know, things happen. Don't blame the oil and gas industry. And, you know, perhaps because the land isn't as beautiful as it is where you're from and there's not the kind of attachment to it in, in my part of Texas, um, you know, I wonder about that a lot. I, I also wonder what it does to a person's soul to be working in that industry. My dad, you know, um, my dad was a medic in the Vietnam War. So he survived the Vietnam War and came home to my hometown and immediately went to work in safety department in the petrochemical plant in my hometown where he spent the rest of his working life you know going every day to a place that could blow at any minute right where he spent you know the rest of his working life dealing with chemical spills and traumatic amputations you know and that was his and that was his world and at the same time right as hard as that life was the, the only thing worse than an oil boom is an oil bust, right? You know, because the, you know, there's this old adage in my hometown that, you know, in the midst of an oil bust, the only person making any money is a U-Haul guy, right? Um, and so, you know, there was this, there, there very much is this kind of resistance to ever criticizing the oil and gas industry because, you know, without the oil and gas industry, you're not keeping a roof over your family's head, right? You're not, you don't have a chance of sending, you know, any of the kids to college, which where I'm from, you know, even today is still, you know, um, you know, a, a, a real dream for most people to have enough money to send that first kid to get a college degree, you know. So it's, um, you know, it's, it's, it's complicated, you know, and, and where I grew up, you know, like where you grew up, we, we watched neighbors dying from, you know, rare cancers, right, <laughs> um, and explosions and accidents. But, but I think the one thing that Odessa does not have that y'all have, you know, is, is in our recent history, that horrific event of the oil, the BP oil spill, you know, Odessa has been more of a sort of slow rolling, I call it a sort of a hundred year environmental disaster, you know, um, and, and what we're seeing play out there now then is, you know, earthquakes, for example, in my hometown for the first time, you know, and, and, and I wonder if we had had that kind of major event that might have shocked people's consciences, you know, in a way we might be a little more in line with Louisiana now. I mean, I think Louisiana has definitely entered the national consciousness because of, um, you know, the, the Katrina and and Rita, the, the, the year of horrible hurricanes, and then um, and then the oil spill ten years or five years later. Um, I think in in neither neither of our home places are really charismatic megafauna, you know. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> like, you know, the Louisiana landscape is it's people are attached to it. It has a kind of beauty, but it's not really a destination unless you happen to want to be on an alligator tour, you know, <laughs> it's got, it's got quirks, but it's not like a California that's, that's, you know, that makes people's heart stir unless they are intimately attached to the place. So I think that, um, I think in, in both of the cases that, that definitely at least interferes with the mobilization of a, of a, of a broader support for environmental protection and um, and change, yeah. Uh, related to what you were just saying, um, and the sense of you know fatalism or or you know the the difficulty of you know 
sending a kid to college or, um, or finding some other way to live in a boom and bust kind of economy. Um, the young women in your stories are often having babies very young. They start families young, they get entrenched in this place. And um, one young mother just flees and leaves her child behind. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you feel this sort of economy affects the women in the place and the, particularly the young women and their sense of what their future might be. I mean, you know, most of the women, I mean, the roughnecking is even to this day a real male dominated, you know, um, job, you know, a, a, a real male, real, real male dominated work, um, you know, and so the women that I grew up with and the women who live in my hometown, you know, mostly work in support roles as waitresses and bartenders, you know, retail, that sort of thing, um, you know, and so while there's always, you know, a schism between what men earn and women earn all over this country, you know, in a place like Odessa, that schism is even greater, you know, um, and so, you know, most of the women I knew, you know, were very much dependent, you know, on, on the men in their lives to, you know, keep a roof over their head. Um, most of the women I knew, um, college, not only was college not an option, but it wasn't even really something, you, you know, a lot of women even were able to really seriously consider, you know, um, and the idea, you know, that if you did go to college that you would do it for anything other than, you know, the very practical realities, right, of earning a, a, a living um, was really um, not on most people's radar. Um, but, you know, they, there, was, there, were, there were other things afoot. You know, my book is set in 1976, and in one of my chapters, I write a long scene where a young woman who's, who's 25 and her daughter is nine years old, right, and she finds herself pregnant with her second child and she doesn't want to be, you know, and so to get access to an abortion in 1976, she has to put her little girl in the car and drive 350 miles to the abortion clinic in Albuquerque, <laughs> right? Um, and when I wrote that chapter and ran it past some, you know, beta readers, they were like, you're going to have to explain this to, you know, a, a reader today because people aren't going to understand this. So 1976 was post Roe v. Wade, right? And of course, also, you know, people have access. Um, you know, if you went to my hometown today, right, and you needed access to women's health care, you would have to drive about 300 miles to get that. Um, last week, I did a, an event with the Crisis Center of West Texas. We have, you and I haven't had a chance to talk about it yet. It was one of the best things I've done so far. It was amazing. Um, it was their book group, and there were about 12 or 13 women who had read the book and wanted to talk about it. The Crisis Center of West Texas runs the Domestic Violence and Survivors of Sexual Assault programs in Odessa, and uh, they're housed in the building where the Planned Parenthood used to be, you know, mm -hmm. so, you know, that's, that's where they, that's where, the, that's where their corporate offices are, because, you know, the Planned Parenthood was run out of town by the state of Texas, you know, about 15 years ago, so, so it's really a case of kind of the more things change, the more they stay the same, so these were the women and girls that I sort of you know, grew up around, um, you know, and, and I thought a lot about, you know, the impossibility of knowing oneself or knowing one's own hopes and dreams, right? When motherhood is kind of thrust upon you, you know, at 15, 16, 17 years old. Jenny, the character that you're talking about who leaves, you know, is a, is a, is a quirky young girl who, who finds herself in love with art. Right. Um, she, she, you know, when her daughter's napping, you know, she, she sits on the toilet, holed up in the bathroom and looks at art in America, right? A book she's checked out from the library. So when she flees her hometown, you know, in addition to fleeing, you know, what she sees is a life that's been sort of foisted on her, right? She's also fleeing toward, you know, um, beauty. Right, there's this wonder, one of my favorite moments in the book is where her grandma says to her, an old lady says to her, you know, um, if you wanted to spend your life thinking about beauty, you should have been born somewhere else, right? Um, and so, you know, these are the, the kind of women that, that, you know, that sort of occupy my thoughts and, and, and my books, you know. Mm -hmm. There's some nice questions coming up on oh, the, 
the, I always forget to look. <laughs> so there's one for you, Beth. Uh, someone from my book club wants to know if Elizabeth had any alternative endings. Our book club was very torn between wanting a tied up ending and being happy about the non-resolution in our interpretation. Yeah. Well, it never would have been tied up just because that's not how I operate. You know, I didn't, I never wanted, I never want to tie things up too neatly and anything ever <laughs> made to a fault. Um, but there were alternative, there was an alternative ending that I actually stuck with for a very long time before I, I decided to um, go back to, um, to, to the young woman who, who sort of starts the book off and, and let her and her family have the last word in the book. Um, but no, I would never have tied it up too neatly in part because that doesn't, um, that doesn't, that doesn't sort of jibe with what I, you know, believe you know, art does or life does or really anything does. Um, so yeah, but yeah there were alternative endings. <laughs> I love about your book that even the, you know, they, the women in this book, and I won't, have, I won't, you know, issue any spoilers, but the women in this book find a kind of justice, but it's a really damaging kind of justice. You know, it, 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 it requires moral compromises on their part to say the least you know um and you know even while the 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 reader might celebrate what becomes of the um the young man who rapes the girl in the first chapter um it, it's still horrifying that it it had to be a matter taken into the hands of the women and not in the you know and it wasn't handled by the justice system so that ambiguity it does it's not an easy sort of victory you know I love that about it yeah I mean I had I had various I had the last line of the first story in your book that just I just freaking kills me um the last line of the first story in your book um, you know, is about then the first story in your book is about a young woman who basically stashes her baby in the closet so she can go out. And when I say young woman, I mean basically a child, right? Because she's what, 17 years old, you know, and she's got this new baby and she stashes her in the closet so she can enjoy, you know, an evening away. Um, and the, the last line of that first story is just so striking to me. Um, her grand, she's back and you know, she's, she's still struggling to really take care of this child. Um, and, uh, and, and, uh, and her father, her father says to her mother and her sister who are trying to basically get her to step up to the plate, let her be, you're right. She's fine. Just let the child do right. And this kind of, this kind of lack of, um, I guess guidance, you know, that that your characters see and my characters see, that really means they're they're kind of in the world to fit, and they're they're there to they have to fend for themselves, you know, and yet they find ways to do that, right? Every single one of our characters finds a way to step up to the plate. It might not be tidy, right, um, mm -hmm. or moral, right, <laughs> but they but they do it, right? They find a way to step up to the plate, and they find a way to support each other too in ways that. Um, you know, that, that, um, that are really um, feel to me, go to the kind of heart of what our teacher back in Iowa, you know, talked about constantly, Marilyn Robinson, the sort of dignity of the, of the, you know, of the person, right? The dignity of the human spirit. So mm -hmm. the ability to find courage and survive in, in wherever, right? So. Yeah, yeah, I think of the ending of, of um, the story that I read from today. Um, the the girl I mean the her great moment is to go to her typing class you know like that's that's her act of heroism but it kind of is you know that's that's right. looking to the future at least right uh, and it's it it's also a compromise though you know well and as a girl who is a lot like Deanna myself actually <laughs> you know you just I mean those you just never know right I mean you never know where that 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 first tiny step, right? Mm -hmm. The kind of thing that I think a lot of people that you and I've known since we left our, our hometowns would see as um, unimportant or even, you know, um, insufficient, right? Can make all the difference in the world. So you've gone to class in high school and, you know, actually listened to, to Miss Kareen, you know, right. <laughs> you know, getting high in her bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Eileen asks, um, how was my growing up in Lake Charles and when did I leave? I wanted to get out so badly. Um, and I 
I left when I went to Louisiana School for Math, Science, and the Arts, which is in the, uh, it's a publicly funded boarding school. Uh, so it's a fancier education than we could ever have afforded. Um, but it's, it's a magnet school that draws kids from all over the state, often from, you know, poor backgrounds and, and, and school systems that do not serve them. I, luckily in Lake Charles, I was in a pretty decent school, you know, but, um, but Louisiana school was such a shiny alternative. Um, so you go and live there and um, you're there with other kids who are curious and readers and are looking toward college, even if you you know, I never thought of college as an option until I went to Louisiana school, you know, <laughs> um, I didn't, I didn't really know people who did that. Um, so that, that's when I left and I, I have gone back for visits every year as many times as I, I can. Um, but, but that was the, that was the turning point for me. Uh, Lake Charles felt small. Mm -hmm. And curious. I wonder if we could go back for just a second and talk about the way people value, say, the coast of California, mm -hmm. you know, or the Alaskan refuge as, a, as places that are worth saving, right, from the oil and gas industry, while they don't necessarily value, say, the desert, mm -hmm. right, or the swamp, the bayou as places mm -hmm. worth saving. And, and, and I agree, you know, it, they're not as, as obviously beautiful, right? But like the place where I grew up, you know, is the, the Permian Basin is the meeting of basically three separate ecologies. There's the high plains, the mountain, and the basin ecologies, right? And so it has a tremendous diversity, particularly of plants. Um, the Permian Basin has something like 270 grass species, right? Um, it, is a, it, is a major, um, it is a major stop for migrating birds. Um, you know, the, the sandhill cranes show up there in mass, you know, every November. Um, and, and I, and I wonder about, you know, um, you know, as you and I've left our home places and talked with people, um, I call you know, my lefty friends here up in Chicago, for example, and we talk about, you know, something like a post petroleum world, which is coming, it's inevitable. And what that looks like, I think something you and I've noticed a lot in those conversations is the, is the, you know, is the is the failure to see deserts and, and bayous as beautiful places in their own right, but also a kind of a failure to sometimes take into account the human realities of those places. Yeah, I think uh, for one thing, um, the the mucky, stinky coastline of Louisiana, where you wouldn't necessarily want to be because mosquitoes and malaria. It's not a it's not a tourist destination. But it's it's um, a, the breeding ground for shrimp and all all manner of fish and um, the the all the seafood that we eat up here um, gets its start as like tiny little creatures in this um, in this the the um, estuary system of Louisiana and um, also migrating birds all these pretty little songbirds that we see up here in Maine you know they're so lovely the goldfinches etc. Um, they literally fall out of the sky on their in their voyage across the Gulf into the um, into the marshes of Louisiana that their resting place and if it's not there um, where where will they where will they fall you know where will they rest on their way to, to northern parts um, so it's these places I think are are they're important parts of the larger ecosystem even if they're not you know, even if they don't have that sort of transcendent beauty of, of a place like California. Um, at the same time, yeah, also um, a change to a green economy. Well, I, I strongly welcome it. It has to happen. Um, and, but it's going to mean major upheaval for the, 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 these, the humans living in these places who have become dependent on the oil economy. Um, and it will probably mean a saying goodbye to the place um, in some cases because there won't be work. The fishing industry can't, as Mainers know, the fishing industry is in decline and it can't support um, the sort of generations long um, handing down of, of, you know, fishing traditions that it once could. So. No, agreed. I mean, I think about that a lot that, you know, um, well, I, I actually find the desert. I have 
I have grown to truly love the desert and, you know, as I've become an adult um, and really um, see it as, as, as truly beautiful, you know, um, sparse, but beautiful. This is similar. We don't have mosquitoes, you know, um, but, uh, you know, you wouldn't step foot and you wouldn't, you would not get in your car on a June day and drive away from anywhere without at least a couple of gallons of water in your car and a contingency plan, right? Um, because you could die out there <laughs> and, and people do, right? Um, but I, I've grown to see it as, as tremendously beautiful. And I've thought a lot about the idea that, you know, my without oil and gas, Odessa really, you know, this, this small city of 80,000 people would still be, you know, a town of about 1,500 people who, you know, came in from, you know, their, their, their land, right? And, and, and threw a couple of cows on the train to ship them off to El Paso or Fort Worth or whatever. And, and, and I'm, I'm okay, I think, in a lot of ways with the idea that there are some places that just won't be able to sustain those population centers, you know, and, you know, when we're finally done with oil and gas. Um, but, you know, you still have to, I mean, you still have to, you have to acknowledge and deal with the human cost of that, right? You know, and, and what do you do? You know, how do you retrain people? How do you find work for people? How do you, how do you adjust an economy? And, and how do you make your peace with the idea that there are places that maybe just are meant to be uninhabited? Or, or, or barely inhabited, right? Um, you know, mm -hmm. so I feel like there's an opportunity there too, though, right? I mean, I talked a little bit about how, you know, it took leaving Odessa for me to really come to appreciate the value of quiet, uninhabited, isolated places, you know, um, places where you can still see SARS, right? Um, you know, up in Big Bend, um, around, or rather around Fort Davis, which is mostly Big Bend, by which I mean only a couple of hundred miles difference, which is nothing in that part of the world, right? <laughs> you drive 300 miles for a cheeseburger and a football game. Um, you know, up in the Fort Davis area, you know, that's a dark sky park, you know, and those are things that, I mean, I, I wonder, you know, if in your part of the world, there's an opportunity to, um, you know, to, to kind of, to show these places to people who aren't familiar with them and enjoy them in more sort of appropriate ways, right, than just sort of mining, you know, just taking what you can get and, and leaving them behind. And of course, as you and I both know, you know, the people who, who, are, who are making these decisions don't live, right? They don't live in Lake Charles. They don't live in Odessa, right? Yeah. yeah. I think we're almost out of time. Oh, um, shoot. I know. Your face well, I miss you. I miss you too. I miss all of you. So it's good to see your face. So Chicago misses you. I miss so. Chicago. I know. I feel like we should wrap lunch up with at least a little something personal. So how's your peanut? Oh, she's great. I have a seven-year-old daughter. I'm trying to figure out where to put her for the fall. <laughs> School is an issue, as everyone knows. Um, any advice? You guys want to offer any advice in the chat screen? <laughs> Get her started working on a novel, Steph. You know, she's, she's got great titles. She wanted me to call um, this collection of stories The Room of Destinations. Ooh. Like, I haven't written that book, but I wish you would. <laughs> <That's great. laughs> yeah. Well, I just wanted to say thank you so much uh, to Steph and Elizabeth. Um, we really appreciate you coming to the literary lunch and, um, and all the way from Chicago, Elizabeth. And um, thanks to everyone who tuned in on this gorgeous main day. Um, thank you so much and, for us. I love the Maine Public Library. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, and we hope to see everyone in person soon, as soon as it's safe. So thanks again, and uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Bye. Steph. Bye. Bye. Thank you for having me. I don't want to let go. I know, me either. <laughs>